So, good morning to the Karen YouTube audience here on the weekend of the Martin Luther King holiday in 2022. Good morning again to those of you who are able to be with me in person, and good morning to those of you who are out there on live stream. Uh, I have uh, thought to start in a way, um, I kind of don't like it when uh, I go to worship and homeless to start with jokes, but I'm, I'm doing it. So, uh, one is I heard uh, an expression in Alcoholics Anonymous years ago. It's not really a joke, but we'll get to the jokes in a minute. So, this expression in Alcoholics Anonymous condenses into a very uh, short set of statements, something that I think is at the heart of what I want to talk about. And it is, like much of the material from AA, um, not uh, politically correct and socially aware and gender inclusive. So, uh, but I heard it years ago and I'll tell it the way I heard it. So the way I heard it was, <clears throat> first the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes the man. And that spoke to me in terms of my experience. I am a person in long-term recovery and I remember feeling that that happened to me. That very early on I tried it, then I experienced this sense in which in the midst of my use, it was the use that was driving the use, and eventually it overtook my life. Jokes. So, a guy and a friend are walking along a beach at low tide, and they find a bottle attached to a pier right at the edge of the water. And there's alcohol in it, and they taste it, and they start drinking it, and they begin to become intoxicated. And they notice that the bottle has a unique property of staying full. <laughs> and uh, they think it's the greatest thing they've ever discovered. It's a miracle. And while they're sitting there getting sloshed, one of them looks up, and they notice that the high water mark of the tide of the pier is above their heads and that the water is starting to come in. So the tide has turned. And the one says, do you notice where the high tide mark is? And the guy says, yeah. He says, well, what are we gonna do about that? And the other one gets, says, I guess we're gonna die here. <laughs> Some of you will get the joke. Uh, second joke, same point. Person reading the classified ads, I don't know, some of you don't even know what classified ads are. But anyway, there were ads in the back of newspapers. Tiny little ad that says, uh, free week in Bermuda and all you can drink. And uh, the guy's a little suspicious, but he calls the number and they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, you can come and make an appointment and we'll uh, orient you to the whole process. And so he goes to this uh, mysterious address and uh, he checks in. and. They invite him into a room, and there is this beautiful, comfortable setting with a bar stock with every imaginable liquor. And he's like, God, this is great. And, uh, you know, televisions and everything like that. So he starts to consume, and eventually his pattern is to consume until he passes out, which was my pattern. So he passes out, and he wakes up on what I had to Google to find out what the, the name was. He wakes up on a trireme, which is one of these ancient Egyptian rowing ships. <laughs> and there's, there's, gangs of people to the left and the right of him who are rowing. <laughs> and the guy sitting in says, hey, you need to row. So he grabs the oar and he starts rowing. He starts sweating profusely because he's terribly hungover. And all of a sudden he puts two in the air and he goes, oh no, I guess we're rowing to Bermuda. So he says to the guy next to him, how long do you think it takes to row to Bermuda? The guy says, three days. The first guy says, how do you know? He says, well, that's how long it took last year. Oh, come on. Anyway. <laughs> the insanity of addiction is depicted a little bit in my humor. But also, like, what I want to reflect on is the way humor is used for the discussion of things that are painful. Humor around funerals, humor around the circumstances that brought you here. My guess is those of you who are here have laughed more since you have been here than in the days, real belly laughs, than in the days before you got here. They count the same number of days. You've been here 20 days, think about how many laughs you've had, and how many laughs you've had in the, in the immediate 20 days preceding a lot. Dramatic difference. But 
As a child, Robert Heinlein, the science fiction writer, influenced my life in a great way. Um, one of the things that I learned from reading tons of Heinlein was that all humor is at someone's expense. There's always a but of the joke. And the suffering that brings us to being an audience and a media presenter here is a kind of insane captivity captured in this dark humor. And it really is awful. I mean, it is a, it's a miserable imprisonment to be a victim. And if it hasn't gotten miserable for you yet, God bless you. But I, I assure you, if you have found your way to a seat at Karen, it is likely to get really miserable if you're not able to sort of harvest the gift of this experience and make the turn into reality. Because I just watched it get worse and worse and worse, and eventual sickness, institutionalization, death, imprisonment, literal imprisonment, are the ends of this sort of story for some reason. So, when I started to consume as a young, young person, I think I started using 11, 12, 13. And by 13 or 14, I was daily using substances. Started more with you know, marijuana and hallucinogens and cocaine because I didn't have the access to alcohol that later I would have. But I would tell you that early on, I was exercising my freedom by drinking. I thought of my drinking as a right and often as a rebellious thing. Like my parents would catch me and say, you know, you need to stop smoking weed or God, they only knew about selling drugs and all that stuff. And, and I, I sell the hypocrisy. I was like, well, you're not stopping drinking, so why should I stop? So I, I thought of it as a freedom that I was entitled to. But when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous a very, very long time ago now, I can't believe it. Um, some of you were here last week when I could see my 33 year medallion. So, 33 years ago, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and the week that I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was, in, I was uh, made familiar with a piece of paper that has followed me through the years. And most of you here at Karen, here at least somewhere, it's actually a set of paragraphs taken from the AA signature text beginning on page 83. It's called The Promises. Uh, you guys hear The Promises? You know, and so The Promises are a, a series of statements which suggest that if one experiences the fullness of recovery, various things can happen. And the very first of The Promises is a new freedom and a new happiness. And at the beginning of my recovery, I remember like looking at that and thinking, huh, a new freedom. And I didn't really, I didn't, probe it thoughtfully. I didn't like interpret the new and you know do some spiritual reflection like I'm trying to do this morning. But I would like to share with you that I think that that qualifier on freedom of new is really important. Because it's not the freedom I thought of when I was 15 or 16, which was a disrespectful freedom that, that was rebellious and, and in disregard to you know people who cared about me. Screw you, it's my weekend, it's my money, it's my time, it's my business, I'll do what the hell I want. It was my notion of freedom at that time. But as I, and as I came into my recovery, I started experiencing new freedoms that I never knew like to think about, uh, but in hindsight, I guess they would have been obvious. So I'll just name a few of them that were the early fruits of the freedoms of recovery. One was no hangovers. Which was like a great boom. It was wonderful. Another was uh, no constant like leakage out of my checking account, and uh, you know insufficient funds issues, and uh, you know um, no no more tangle. No, I used to actually it stayed with me for a while, but eventually I shook the terror I would see whenever I see people in law enforcement because I used to like every time I see a cop, I'd be like, ah! because pretty much I was like. 
under suspicion, and I had previous arrests and all that sort of stuff. And so these new freedoms were really real to me. Those were real and meaningful freedoms. Was a life without those particular forms of hell. I could safely put a toothbrush in my mouth in the morning without fear of dry heat. Or I could, you know, uh, and I could be invited to go to something that was several hours long and not worry about how I was going to maintain my intoxication level in an environment where I would have to sneak and hide it. So those are the practical and really, they're not mundane or insignificant. They're really delicious and wonderful. As you, as you begin to experience those freedoms, I can assure you that you will find a happiness, a new happiness in that. It's really, it's like a, it's a peculiar thing because I think most of I think many people, as they begin recovery, have a feeling that I had, which was, oh, I'm going to have to throw in the towel. I felt like the, the great sports player who was, you know, walking off the field down the corridor and had to throw in the towel and, you know, would never get out on the field again kind of thing. And I, I was completely unaware that weeks and months later I would be thinking, wow, this is awesome. Like, I'm like... I'm not hung over, and I have money in my checking account. And I remember the first year I bought a new car, and my spouse at that time was like, you can't afford that. And I'm like, take a look at the checking account. Liquor store, ATM, liquor store, ATM, liquor store, ATM, grocery. I said, the liquor store and ATM is all the drugs and alcohol. So I can't afford the car. <laughs> if I'm not doing that, I can afford the car, right? So it was a really nice car. and. Uh, that was, that was a new freedom, terribly materialistic, but there it is. So, things continue to happen in my recovery. Good and bad. I survived the grisly murder of my brother in the second year of my recovery. I didn't drink. That was just one of the things. The death of my mother in the fifth year of my recovery. Didn't drink. And, and I went from cynical, bitter, angry, fearful, lonely, isolated, and ashamed atheist to tentative seeker to person of faith, at least in the synchronicity thing that I was talking about. Like this week, the promises. I went to an AA meeting on Saturday morning, and it was about the promises. And I knew I was preaching today about freedom. So I was like, wow, isn't that like a beautiful little, it's, to me it was a wink from God. Like, and Martin Luther King weekend, like all, all that sort of stuff. And I've been uh, reminded of one of the great influences in my life, not only Dr. You might be surprised, given my cultural and historical and ethnic background, that uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has been very important to me. But I was trained in my movement out of atheism and into faith and clergy life by a in preaching by a great African American historical preacher who just died last year, Bobby McLean. Very, very famous preacher um, had known uh, Dr. King, and um, and when Bobby was my preaching coach. He had us listen to Dr. King's messages. And I actually bought the entire library of audio recordings of Dr. Martin Luther King on DVD. And I would listen to them in the car with a meeting back and forth the center. So I listened to a ton of the recorded material. Um, and it, it always spoke to me about addiction, even though a great deal of the freedom that Dr. King originally spoke about was civil rights and the community out of which he was raised, the African American community. But one of the things that also has struck me in the last week or so as I was reflecting on speaking with you this morning is and another synchronicity. Just recently, Dr. Desmond Tutu passed away, and I heard an interview from him that I mentioned in chapel last week. And um, that interview had, is, is in my thought now. And one of the things that happened for Archbishop Tutu was after being successful in helping the country that he loved move out of 
an authoritarian regime with its discriminatory policies to a democracy, but then later in his life realizing that the democracy which it formed was, was, was failing to live into its vision and hope. And so he, he criticized the very government he helped to bring to birth, and people were really mad at him about it. But also, if you pay attention to Martin Luther King, near, in the last year or two of his life, he was criticized by many of the constituents of his own community for enlarging his vision to understand that uh, it was persons of any, of any sort of marginalization that his vision would apply to. And uh, that was another reason why Archbishop Tutu was criticized was because he was, became an outspoken advocate for what today we would describe as the LGBTQ plus IA2S community. And the reason I bring all that up is to say to you that those new freedoms I found in my early recovery of no hangover were, were only the beginning of a set of freedoms. And today, the freedoms that I would want to give you a glimpse of, if I could point you to the mountain, like the horizon of the freedom of what recovery holds for us, it is what my friend Father Bill used to talk about as loving and being loved. It is a connection with the God of your understanding. It is meaningful belonging and willingness to, to, to be known and to know others in an incredible way. That the fellowship of the drunk at the bar never can really reach. There is a, a communion, and I use that word because we talk about that in the chapel service. I, there is a communion that becomes possible when you no longer are drowning in that pier by the water waiting for the tide to come on and no longer <laughs> rowing in the boat. To live into the fullness of your humanity and to find also in that the way in which you have a reflection of your divinity, the, the sacredness of you. And That might sound really high and poetic, high-minded and poetic, and I will admit absolutely this, I need it to be. But I'm cheering up because I absolutely believe that you have been robbed of your humanity and your dignity by this affliction. And that one of the great things about being a part of this organization is that every day when I come up this mountain, I get to sort of help cut the chains and let you head on your way and pray for you as you begin. And enjoy the little victories and the little freedoms of no hangovers or whatever, but don't give up when it gets tough because beyond the hurdles of the initial parts of the struggle are these extraordinary other freedoms that are out there that you deserve and that you can find. So, uh, even though it begins with one day at a time, it, it holds this promise of an entirely new kind of existence. And I can't give it to you in 28 days. I can't tell you it will happen in nine months or whatever, it, but, it, but it, it unfolds along the way. Thanks very much.